Welcome to Second Congregational Church here in West Stafford. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on your faith journey, you are welcome here. Just a couple of things. First is uh, the Advent wreath. We have Bruce and uh, Kathy that are going to uh, do that for us this morning. And uh, we have one more week left, so if anyone else would like to participate, please see me after the service. Uh, Christmas Eve is, strangely enough, on the 24th, which is a Friday this year, and be, the service will be here at 6 o'clock. And let's see, what else do I have? Oh, I did have one complaint about the sign. Hopefully this isn't a result of the complaint. But I wanted to explain it. On the sign it said Christmas Eve, but it was X Mass Eve. And a lot of people have the uh, mistaken impression that that X is taking Christ out of Christmas. Well, it's X in our language, but in Greek it's Chi. Chi is the first letter in Christ's name. So Xmas <coughs> stands for Christmas, and it's a, it's a good little abbreviation for it. And since we were running out of letters, it's a good, good chance to replenish the letter supply. Since we were running out of letters, I chose to use that abbreviation, so I was not being disrespectful. You just have to know Greek. Okay. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of peace. We light it and the candle of hope again, as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to judge the world and bring it everlasting peace. candle of Advent is the candle of joy. When the angel Gabriel told Mary that a special child would be born to her, she was filled with joy. She sang a song that began with the words, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Just as the birth of Jesus gave great joy to his mother, so his presence in the world gave joy to those who had none before. He healed them and gave them hope and peace when they believed in him. From hope, peace, and love grows joy. We light the candle of joy to remind us that when Jesus is born in us, we have joy, and that through him there will be everlasting joy on earth. Joy is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the joy we find in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the joy you give us. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true, and Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your joy with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who is born in Bethlehem. Amen. The opening hymn is Bring a Torch to that Isabella, number 124. Softly to the little stable, softly for a moment. 
preaching seems harsh to our modern public relations sensitive ears. To his own generation, he must have appeared to be much like the early prophets of Israel, such as Amos, Micah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Luke interpreted John's preaching as good news. That may surprise us because outspoken prophets are not usually welcome today when they attack established power structures, as John did. Ultimately, John was executed by the brutal puppet king, Herod Antipas, for accusing him of immoral marriage. So let us hear these words now from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, 
God is able from these very stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of it by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Here ends this morning's reading of God's holy word. We thank you, O God, for your willingness to share your wisdom with us. Grant us wisdom and understanding for the reading and the hearing of these holy words. Please be with me in prayer. O God, light of the minds that know you, life of the souls that love you, and strength of the thoughts that seek you, bless the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts, Breathe into us that we may live in the manner that you will for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let me say it again. Rejoice. The Lord is near. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That comes from Philippians chapter 4. And it was written by the Apostle Paul some 2,000 years ago. And we've heard him say it again today. Rejoice. And because these words became the traditional opening chant in the medieval mass on the third Sunday of Advent, this day became known as Gaudet Sunday from the Latin word rejoice. Rejoice is one of the most important words in the Bible. It's full of electricity, meant to jolt you out of sleep and despair. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O God of Jerusalem, said the prophet Zephaniah. God will rejoice over you with gladness. God will dance with shouts of joy for you. God will dance. In Aramaic, which was the language of Jesus, the word for rejoice is also the word for dance. An old Jewish midrash takes great delight in this double meaning. And it says, in the time to come, the Holy One, blessed be He, will lead the chorus of the righteous and they will dance around Him and point to him, saying, This is God, our God forever and ever. God will lead us with youthfulness, with liveliness. So on this Sunday of joy, or Rejoice Sunday, as we celebrate the dancing God, who is this wild man in the desert crashing the party, calling us snakes, shouting about wrath, who let him in? 
You brood of vipers. You snakes. What are you doing here? You really think you're going to escape from the mess you've made? Is that what you think? Don't tell me about your spiritual heritage. That's not going to save you. You've got to show you mean business. You've got to turn yourselves around and get right with God. You say you're Abraham's children. Well, God doesn't care a fig about that. You say you go to church. So what? Are you bearing any fruit? I don't see it. Your hearts are nothing but dead trees. Where is the fruit? Where is the juice? You know what happens to dead trees. They get cut down, leaving nothing but stumps. Now look, I'm baptizing with water the ones who really want to change. But I tell you there's someone coming after me who's a lot more powerful than I am. I'm not even fit to tie his shoes. And he's not going to be using any water to baptize you. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The widowing fork is already in his hand. He's clearing the threshing floor and gathering the wheat into the barn. But the chaff? Oh, the chaff. He's going to burn in a fire that will never go out. So people listen. It's time to get ready. Stay awake. Keep watch. Change your lives. Real positive message. What an uplifting guy John was. Such an intrusion. Such a message. And such a messenger seem shockingly out of place on a joy someday. Thank God that no wild prophets have wandered into our midst today. But you never know. About 25 years ago, a pastor in California asked his friend if he would make a surprise Advent appearance at his church dressed and acting like John the Baptist. No one else in the congregation knew this was going to happen, not even the ushers, who looked at this stranger nervously when he entered the church in bare feet and a tattered old robe. At the moment when the gospel was to be read, he came up the aisle, looking people in the eyes as he delivered John's fiery message. Then after one last warning to stay awake and to keep watch, he slipped out the door and disappeared. This uh, bit of guerrilla liturgy got mixed reviews from the congregation, as you'd expect. But if the Bible is a living word, it doesn't just tell stories about people in the past. It confronts and challenges us today as well as the biblical truths retell themselves in our own stories. But be that as it may, what are we to make of the Baptist's unsettling message? Perhaps his most troubling phrase is, the wrath to come. Now it conjures up all those abusive old images of an angry, judgmental, and vindictive God. Images which have done a lot of harm over the centuries. Even though Jesus made it pretty clear that the heart of the law is mercy. And the end of all our stories is the victory of love. So, what is this wrath to come. I believe it's really something of our own devising. If we break the laws of the universe, we will find ourselves contradicted by a reality more true and lasting 
than the constructions of our own self-will. If we engage in destructive behaviors, those chickens will come home to roost. Or as C.S. Lewis put it, we are not punished for our sins. We are punished by our sins. We all experience this kind of blowback on the level of personal behavior whenever we reap what we have sown. But it is true on a collective level as well. The rapid acceleration of climate change makes this abundantly clear. For example, there were blizzard warnings last week in Hawaii. For decades, we humans have been either unwilling or unable to change our ways. And now, the consequent wrath is getting too big to ignore. A recent cartoon depicting a climate change denier puts this perfectly. A skeleton is lying on its back on the ground, baked and parched, and nothing is growing. It's a wasteland, devoid of life, and the skeleton still has its fingers and its ears. Nobody's going to convince him about any wrath to come. But perhaps the most interesting and hopeful thing about today's Gospel reading is that the people, even after being so fiercely chastised and challenged by the prophet, do not put their fingers in their ears. Instead, they ask the Baptist, what should we do? John responds to each questioner in very concrete ways. And as the story concludes, what looked like judgment, the axe and the fire, turned out to be a strange form of good news. The best thing that could have happened because it spurred people to let go of the unsustainable chaff and begin to change their ways. Prophets can be hard, but they are so necessary to move us to repentance and to action. Thank God for all those who push us where we need to go, who urge us towards transformation. We must change our lives, they tell us. And the time is now. It's not, I mean, it's hard not to feel overwhelmed by the immense challenges looming before us. Where do we turn for the hope and the courage and the strength that we need for facing all these mountainous tasks? What faith says is this. We turn to God, our Savior. We turn to the one in whom all our hope is grounded. But in a world as secular as ours, where divine intention or activity is not really a natural thing, and things just go on happening whether God is thought about or not, it can seem unintelligible to call God our Savior. What does it mean to say that God will save us? Doesn't our culture teach us to act as if we are pretty much on our own, for better or for worse? Isn't God really an unnecessary hypothesis? People of faith, however, abide in a different story. A story where death does not have the last word. A story where love wins. To say that God will save us is to belong to that story and to live accordingly. And what are the fruits of faith's life-shaping story? Trust, confidence, hope, and the kind of invincible joy which Paul proclaims with such passion. Rejoice! Again I say rejoice. 
In the Book of Lamentations, a text drenched in the tears of profound suffering, we find one of the most hopeful verses in all of Scripture. It says, when my soul is bowed down, I keep one thing in mind, and so recover hope. Love's mercies are never exhausted. They are renewed every morning. In the faith story, no matter how rocky the road or dangerous the journey, our path leads beyond every annihilation toward an unimaginable fulfillment. What has been broken will be restored. What has been wounded will be healed. What has been lost will be found. If such a hope were a statement about the world, it would be a foolish optimism, soon blown away by the winds of calamity. But Christian hope is not a statement about the world. It's a statement about God. Hope is not about what the person or the creature can do. It's about the never-ending resourcefulness of the Creator who turns darkness into light, brings life out of death, even to the blackest of night. God will bring the dawn. A pastor friend of mine shared one of his Advent rituals, playing a recording of Jackson Brown's For a Dancer, an encouraging song imbued with prayerful hope, despite being written in a time of personal loss. But these are the lyrics. Keep a fire for the human race. Let your prayers go drifting into space. You never know what will be coming down. Perhaps a better world is drawing near, just as easy it could all disappear, along with whatever meaning you might have found. Don't let the uncertainty Turn you around, go on, and make a joyful sound. Into a dancer you have grown, from a seed someone else has thrown. Go on ahead and throw some seeds of your own. We are all dancers. You wouldn't want to see me dance, but we are all dancers. People who rejoice in hope come what may. Don't let the uncertainty turn you around. Go on and make a joyful sound. Uh -oh. Technical difficulties. Hold on. Now, to say that God is our Savior does not mean that God does all the work. <coughs> Faith is not a passive thing. To be called into the story of God's unfolding future means we ourselves have a lot of work to do. The work of changing our lives. The work of letting go of what is unsustainable. The work of repairing a broken world. The work of becoming love's body in the here and now. Go on ahead and throw some seeds of your own. So let's get busy, fellow vipers. There's a lot of work to do. Amen. Amen. Our hymn is, O Come All You Faithful. 135 in the new century. Oh,
here this morning we cast our mind back on the events of this last week and forward into the events to come. The things that may bring us pain and those that may bring us joy as well. So as we pray this morning, keep those joys and concerns in your mind and raise them up to God. Let us pray. Loving God, make us ready to receive the gift. We need to become the people that you have created us to be. Help us to recognize within ourselves those things that need to come to the light of day and to be tamed by your spirit. Nourish such longing in us for your coming into our lives that we may grow into more humble and more joyful Lord Jesus, come and bring your joy this Christmas. Come and bless the ones we love. Come with the gifts that never break. The knowledge that we are loved and we are precious. The awareness that we belong and are valued. The realization that we're welcome and can welcome others. Give us the joy that turns ordinary food into a holy feast that makes our friends and family the best and the finest company, and which fills us with wonder and ecstasy that the shepherds found in the stable. Your coming has changed our history, God, and given us a brighter future. Help us celebrate this Advent and Christmas season wholeheartedly and open generously, and to see that Christ can smile at us in every human face that we meet. Father, we hold before you too this day those in our family, our church, our community, and our world who have a special need of your loving touch. We pray in the name of our Savior, born in Bethlehem, Jesus who is the Christ. Amen. Amen. God calls us to create a community which welcomes all, to care for the infirm, to heal the shame of the outcast, to create a welcome for all. Let these gifts that we offer begin this process of reconciliation. The morning offering will now be received.
dedication as it is found in the bulletin. Let us pray. Take these gifts and gather us back together, O God. We who have separated ourselves from our neighbors, from our higher selves, and from your expansive love, reunite us with our calling. Amen. Our closing hymn is Angels We Have Heard on High, the 116 on Pilgrim Hymn.